Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us from around the world. My name is Father Chris Alar. I'm one of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception right here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And today we have a special online streaming presentation of a walkthrough of the Mass. I promise you it will be informative, it will be fun, but most of all, it will be educational into learning how we can understand the Mass better so that we can love the Mass better. And so we have so many opportunities in our life to give praise to God, but there is none greater than right here in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So we're gonna walk you through it step by step and telling you along the way what you need to know, how you need to um, approach the Mass, and what you need to understand about it so you can love it even more. Okay, so let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we place ourselves before you and we ask through the holy sacrifice of the Mass that we always be brought closer to you in union and most of all to receive and live your mercy. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Now, if you remember in Scripture, Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So, We come in mass and we gather together. But remember, we are not just a body, we are body, soul, composite. We are both, so this is why we need to engage in worship, not just in the spirit and in prayer of the spirit, but with our whole body as well. You know, people criticize us Catholics of you're always stand, sit, and kneel, but this is actually very important. Why do we stand? We stand at a sign of respect. Why do we kneel? We kneel in humility. We are small. God is big. And kneeling is a position where we need our asking for mercy. When you ask for mercy, you kneel down. This is very important. Now, sitting. Sitting is a receptive position. Normally, I would have some people right here in the pews sitting to receive this message. Hopefully now you are the one sitting to receive this message. So stand, sit, kneel, have meaning, all right? What about genuflecting? People are always like, oh, you Catholics, genuflecting. When do we genuflect? People are always confused by this. No, we don't genuflect in front of even the altar. We genuflect only before the blessed sacrament when we pass by the tabernacle or our Lord on the altar exposed in the Eucharist. We also, there's one day of the year where we genuflect actually in front of the cross, the crucifix, and that's Good Friday. We normally just do a bow, like when we hear the name Jesus and Mary, we just do a bow to show reverence. We don't genuflect uh, in front of the cross normally unless it's Good Friday. All right, now, these bows are just a little bit of reverence. What about singing? Singing is important because it unites personal prayer and communal prayer. You know, um, Jesus sung on his way to the Passion. People don't realize this. Come, participate, especially in singing, even if God didn't give you a good voice. You know, um, your singing and participation doesn't have to be in tune like me. Um, If God didn't give you a good voice, give it back to him. This is what I've always said. So um, anyway, when we sing, we unite with the heavenly choir. Very powerful. Now, what about silence? It's not just all singing. But it's silence too. Silence can be the times we hear God speak to us. Remember Joseph in the gospel, the most powerful words he ever spoke? Nothing. There are no recorded words of Joseph in the gospel. So we have to realize that even silence can be more uh, powerful than words. The mass is all of this. And what we're gonna walk you through is not just what I just talked about, but also the fact that it is entirely scriptural. There is more scripture in one Catholic weekday mass than any Protestant Sunday service, period. And yet we are told we are not scriptural. So if you are tuning in right now, if you are live streaming, shoot a message off to your friends, especially non-Catholics, and say, hey, There's this crazy priest in in Massachusetts that's about to tell us why the Mass is purely scriptural. 
why the Mass is fully from the Bible. And so non-Catholics can join us and to hear an explanation of the Mass, why it is scriptural. All right. The Mass is about giving worship to God. It is not about our entertainment. It is about giving God our worship. The priest is not an entertainer. So don't use that as a reason not to go to Mass. You know, in the Bible, at the Last Supper, Christ instituted the Mass, right? He instituted the Mass as both an eternal sacrifice and a Paschal meal. This Mass is both a sacrifice and a meal, and we have lost that understanding, and I will tell you more about that. All right, for the meal, we use bread and wine and water, the same elements Christ used for his meal in the upper room. The very nature, though, now let's go to the sacrifice. There's the meal, and there's the sacrifice. The very, very nature of a sacrificial act throughout the Old Testament, requires a priest, an ordained priest. And this is why Christ continued that tradition, being ordaining the men in the upper room as the priests and passing that on. They are ordained priests of God to offer sacrifice. All right, what do I mean by sacrifice? Christ, we know, died on the cross. Why, though? I ask this all the time in my catechism classes. Why did Jesus die on the cross? And they always say, Father, to to forgive our sins. Yes, but he's God. He could have forgiven our sins from heaven. Father, to open the door to heaven. Yes, but he could have opened the door to heaven from within heaven. All of these are true. But why did he die on the cross? The penalty for sin is death. All those others are true. Everything that I just mentioned is true. But we forget that Paul says the wage of sin is death. So when I sin or you sin, we deserve to die. We deserve to die. And so when we sin, death was the result that we deserve, but yet Christ paid that in our place. So when you come to mass, and as you see the crucifix of our Lord Jesus Christ, at every mass you see the crucifix of Christ's body, that means you are there, present, at Calvary is he is paying your debt to sin. This is the debt we owe for our sin. It's called death and Christ paid it. Then he conquers it. So he paid it and then he conquers it. This is what's going on at the mass. All right, now, not until the 1500s, the ninth, or in the 1500s, did the Protestants begin to reject this idea of the mass being about sacrifice? And what happened is they replaced it with ceremonies focused on prayers and songs. Those are good, but the basis is sacrifice. And so not until the 1500s did this start to happen. Now, don't fall for the trap in our own church about falling to the extreme one side or the other. Father, I'm only a traditionalist pre-Vatican II. I reject the Novus Ordo Mass. Or being a modernist where I only accept the the modern Mass and the Novus Ordo Mass. That pre-Vatican II stuff is ancient. It's no good. No. Both Masses have infinite grace. Both are infinite mercy. We can't reject either form, the extraordinary form or the ordinary form of the mass. In fact, traditionalists would say, oh, well, Father, people in the 1500s wouldn't recognize our mass today. Is this true? Yeah. But you know who would recognize our mass today? The people of the 700s. You see, this is what people don't understand. The people of the 700s would recognize what we do The Tridentine Mass is not the most ancient form of the Mass. It is not. It's not the first form. Our ordinary form today is actually more traditional than the Tridentine form. People don't get this. I'm not saying one's better than the other. The church has said both are to be said. All right. Our Nova Sordo Mass, what it attempts to do is to get back to the Mass as a sacrifice and a meal. That's the way it used to be. 
This is what happened throughout the centuries. We've lost either the mass being a meal and we only focused on the sacrifice or we focused on the uh, meal and not about the sacrifice. We need both, all right? Both forms are valid. All right, now, let us begin with the very first form of the mass. As you can see on your screen, there's a slide that's called the introductory rites. So you can see on your screen there, the introductory rites is the first part of the mass. Now. I ask you a question, when does the Mass actually begin? And people say, oh, Father, at the song, the singing, uh, not really. In the procession, when the priest comes up the aisle, no. Maybe at the name of the Father, no. It actually begins in your own home, in your preparation of your heart coming here. Now, once we begin the Mass here, we begin with an opening song or an entrance antiphon where the priest will either read, like today, O chosen people, proclaim the mighty works of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Again, that is First Peter, right out of scripture. All right, now, as I said, singing brings us unity as a community with one voice. You know, as St. Augustine said, to sing is to pray twice. Or as my brothers remind me, Father Chris, to sing well is to pray twice. So anyway, then the priest comes in after the opening song or antiphon, and he, what? He kisses the altar, venerates the altar, the table and the cross by which we will gather around as a family, as I said, a meal and a sacrifice. This here, what you're looking at is a table for the meal and a cross for the sacrifice. This is how it was In ancient times, this is how it was in the very first centuries. All right, now, what does the priest then do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Why? We sign ourselves because, as I said, we are body and spirit. We are naming God as the reason we are here. We are here in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We are naming God as the reason we are here. And we mark ourselves Do y'all know what cowboys do to cattle? What do they do? They brand them. They put a mark right on the cattle. And when you do this in the name of the Father, you're touching yourself, you're branding yourself so that you show at the end times that when Christ comes that you belong to him. When the devil tries to take his flock and Christ takes his flock, you're branded with that sign of the cross. Holy water also on our hands, right? Reminds us of our baptism. We become one with Christ for this celebration. So then what do you people say? Amen. What does that mean? I believe. So what's happening here? The priest leads in prayer, but he's not praying without you. He's praying with you. The amen makes it your prayer too. This is what Vatican II stressed. All right, now, the priest then does the greetings. He lifts his hands in a traditional form of prayer, right? Okay. And he says what? The Lord be with you. Okay. You're going to hear this much throughout the mass. So let's look at this. We establish, as I said, that God is present. He is here. And what do you say? And with your spirit. This is biblical. This is 2 Timothy 4.22. The Lord be with your spirit. So God is here, I acknowledge it, and we say this throughout the Mass. All right, then we turn into the penitential rite where we call to mind our sins and we prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Now, why are we calling to mind our sins? Didn't you just have them all forgiven in the confessional? Well, hopefully all your grave sins, but in confession, do we need to confess all sins we can remember, even the little teeny tiny ones? Well, it's not bad if you do, but it's not a requirement. The grave sins you must confess, but the little venial sins, like complaining that my homily is too long, you know, (laughs) those, those can be forgiven in the mass, in the penitential rite. These are forgiven. So go to confession for your grave sins and be cleansed now of the venial sins and you are spotless as you prepare to come forward for Holy Communion in a moment as part of the Mass. All right, now, in the penitential rite, we are not just reminding God of our sins. It is a way for us to see our need for his mercy. 
This is what's going on. All right, so now in the penitential, right, if we pray the confidior, remember the confidior. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words and what I have done and what I have failed to do. What you are doing is you are confessing those sins to our Lord. And then at the end, the priest says, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. You're being cleansed of your venial sins. Now, do you make the sign of the cross? No, that is reserved for sacramental absolution in the confessional. After the priest says, may Almighty God, um, as we say, um, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, you do not make the sign of the cross. Now, are you gonna go to purgatory for a bunch of extra time if you do that? No, but it's just a little habit to, to maybe correct. Now, after this, the, Lord, or the priest says what? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord have mercy, this too is biblical. Tobit, eight, four, Tobit. Let us pray that the Lord may have mercy upon us. This is all scriptural. Then if it's a Sunday mass, we go into what? The Gloria. So we turn to the Gloria. And what does the priest begin? He leads us in this prayer, right? This is the prayer the angel sung at the birth of Jesus. It gives us a chance to praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's look at this. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. As I said before, this Mass is entirely scriptural. People say Catholics are not scriptural. Let's go through all the scripture in this Mass so you can better understand how it is biblical and comes from Christ. Well, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Turn to Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is well pleased. So at the end of the Gloria, we say amen. And what does the priest say? Let us pray. And then he prays from the day Like today, he would pray from the collect, all right? And the collect is a word called collect. We collect ourselves. And so this is very important, all right? This is a prayer, an opening prayer, specific to a particular time of the year or season or feast, okay? All right, now, look on your screen. The next section of the Mass is the Liturgy of the Word. So you see there on your screen, Liturgy of the Word. This is the first big part of the Mass. And the Liturgy of the Word consists of how many readings? People say, Father, two. Nope. Father, three. Nope. Father, four. Yep. Four readings. We have readings from the first reading, traditionally, is from the Old Testament. Second reading you forget is the Psalm. The responsorial Psalm comes from the Book of Psalms. Then we have a third reading, which is sometimes or mostly from the epistles. What is an epistle? Well, I had one of my seventh graders when I asked them that question, guys, what's an epistle? He said, "Uh, Father, an epistle is a baby apostle. And so, no, an epistle is a letter that we have from either Peter or Paul. And anyway, then finally we have the gospel. The first reading is usually from the Old Testament, right, where we see the foretelling of Christ, And the psalm is usually a response to that, a response of faith after hearing that first reading and connecting it to the next readings. The the response to a psalm is a rubber band that connects the two. The second reading then comes from usually the epistles and we thank God and then we have the gospel acclamation, right? Where we acclaim God to the world. We stand, we sing, alleluia. And we rise. Why? Because Alleluia is a joyful song. That is why it's a joyful word, I should say. We praise God. Now, we don't see this in Lent. Why? Because Lent's a time of penance, not joy. But it sets the tone for the gospel and gives us the theme of the gospel. Now, why do we rise? We rise because we are hearing now the words of Jesus himself. Earlier, we just announced that Christ is present in spirit. Now he is present in his actual words. We're moving ahead here. It is important because when an important person comes into the room, you stand out of reverence, all right? So our Lord is coming into the room in word and we rise as a sign of respect. 
Now, Jesus is even more present in hearing his word than he was originally when we began the Mass. It's a deeper presence, all right? First he was present in spirit, now in word, and soon he'll be present in body and blood, soul and divinity. All right, now, Jesus is the living word. You've always heard this, the eternal word television network. When, when the Father speaks, what comes forth? They're all one. When the Father speaks, what comes is the word. The word is the Son. And what powers that word? The breath. The breath is the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father. When he thinks, he speaks. He speaks a word, and that word is the Son. And when that word comes forth, it is powered by a breath. That is the Holy Spirit. So we have to understand that's the Trinity. Jesus is the living word. All right, now, what happens? The celebrant or the deacon is the one who really should read the gospel before the main celebrant. And the priest comes forward and he bows slightly before he goes to the ambo and he says, cleanse my heart and my lips, almighty God, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. This is important because what he's doing is he's getting ready to bring the word to you. Then he walks forward and as the book of Revelation says, the high priest opens the seal and proclaims the word. And this is exactly what the priest does or the celebrating priest or the deacon, right? Now, earlier readings could be a lector, the first reading, the responsorial psalm, and the second reading, but the gospel is either a priest or a deacon, right? Okay, this is very important. All right, now, what we have to do is he professes the gospel. As he does that, what does he say? The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John, according to you, O Lord. And what do you do? You make the sign of the cross where? Forehead, lips, heart. Why? Because this is where God should be. We open our minds, right, to hear God's words. We plan to share those words with others by our lips and we declare we believe in Jesus with our whole heart. Very good, very good. At the end, the word of the Lord, and you say, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then the deacon or the priest kisses the book. If this is the book, he kisses it. Why? He venerates it. And he says, through, you don't hear this. But when the priest is up at the ambo, he says, through the words of the gospel, may our sins, not just mine, but yours. May our sins be wiped away. Then a homily follows. A homily. Now, why do we do a homily? Why is a homily part of the Mass? Well, let's go back to Scripture. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, preach the word. This is coming from Timothy. Be urgent in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke. Ah, please don't tear to pieces your priests when they are teaching the truth. If they are not teaching the truth, then yes, charitable correction is needed, but please don't shred your priests to pieces because they are teaching the truth. I've always said, I don't know why, but in my heart I believe that someday I'm gonna end up in jail. It's already happening around the world in places where the priests are being um, criminalized for teaching what, we, what is called hate. No, the truth is not hate. The truth sets you free. So I always say, eventually my big mouth may get me in trouble, but if it's a big mouth for the Lord, praise be to God. Just. Maybe send me some food in jail when, uh, when I get there if this world continues in the way that it is, right? Okay, so don't forget about me. All right, now a homily is only done by ordained clergy, like priests, bishops, or deacons. It's not to be done by anybody else. Is it mandatory? Is a homily mandatory? Yes, if it's a Sunday, but not on weekdays. And what's the difference between a homily and a sermon? A sermon and homily are different. A homily refers to a specific reading from the Bible, 
and applies it to daily life. So the priest takes a parable or whatever the reading is and applies it to our daily life. A sermon is the opposite. A sermon takes a topic like maybe um, charity and then it goes to all parts of the Bible and pulls all the parts in the Bible that support that one topic. So a sermon is different. It's kind of the same theme, but we as Catholics in our mass have adopted the form of the homilies. So in... Um, a Sunday Mass, what comes after the homily? The priest um, goes back to his chair, a moment of silence, and then we do the profession of faith called the creed. This is only on Sundays or big feasts and solemnities. It's, an, it's a statement of the apostles' faith. All right? This is the statement of the apostles' faith. The creed leads us to an act of faith in the Trinity, this is very important. And what each person does for us in the Trinity. All right, let's look at this. I believe, let's turn to the, 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 uh, the creed. I can't do all of it because of my lack of time here. But I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Where does that come from? Yeah, Father, the church made that up. Nope. Genesis 14, 19, God most holy, maker of heaven and earth. Then the creed says, of all things visible and invisible. Where does that come from? Colossians 1.16. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. What about next? I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Turn to Luke 1.35. Therefore the child to be born shall be called holy, the Son of God. Next, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. What does that mean, consubstantial? They are one, one substance. That comes from John 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. Our creed is biblical. Then, begotten, or excuse me, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Where does that come from? 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. All right, Catholic people think that means we're saying only the four walls of the Catholic church. Yes, there is only salvation, but it doesn't mean that a pygmy in the rainforest can't still be saved. Yes, God will judge them differently. A pygmy in the rainforest who's never received the gospel can still be saved through the natural law right, what grace God puts on his heart, but for us who have been given the fullness of the truth in the sacraments and the mass, this is our way to heaven because it's actual grace. It's salvific. This is the way Christ set it up. Well, Father, I don't need to go to a church. I worship God my own way. Okay, great that you're worshiping God, but do you want to be the one that tells Jesus, you know what, Lord, I get it that you gave us the way in the Bible how to worship you, but I really don't like that way. I kind of like the way of doing it in my shower or maybe on my way to the football game on Sunday. Sorry, it doesn't say that in Scripture. What it does say is this is the way we worship Christ. All right, or God, all the Trinity, right? All right, now, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic means universal. So we turn to Romans 12, 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. That's what Catholic means. All right, so we finish the creed. Now, the Father, the... the um, the creed also explains the Trinity, right? The Father created the world and gave us life, right? The Son, who was human and divine, redeemed that life for us once we got broken, and the Spirit gives us divine life. So get this, this even though our God is one God, it's three persons, the Father created us, the Son redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies us makes us holy to share in the divine life of God and the life we need for salvation. Now, the, the creed concludes with a belief in the resurrection from the dead and the life of the world to come, eternal life. Now, we must pray this because we can't know this on our own. It has to be revealed to us through scripture and the mass. All right, now we're gonna finally finish the, the universe, or excuse me, the liturgy 
of the word with the universal prayer or the prayers of the faithful, right? The one petition that everybody thinks of, you know, we pray for the world, we pray for our church, but these are intercessions. Why do we pray this? Again, turn to Philippians verse one, chapters three and four. I thank God in all my remembrance of you always, in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Basically, we are saying we now are praying for each other. When the church is gathered, and I'm still in the liturgy of the word here, we're finishing up. When the church is gathered, we have the responsibility to pray for each other and the whole church and the whole world because we are united. This is why the order of petitions, we usually start with praying for the church, our Holy Father, our priests, our bishops, our deacons. Then we pray for the world and our governments and our leaders. Whoa, do we need that today? We must pray for them, especially our president. No matter what you think of our president, you have to pray. There are things going on now that are crazy. Again, I don't care what you think of our president, but what's your obligation to do as a Catholic is to pray for your leaders. All right, do you know that there are witches and Wiccans around the world placing hexes on the 13th of every month on our president? And the only way that we can undo this is to be praying for him and offering masses, regardless if you agree or, or you don't like his tact, you need to pray for our leaders. They are still, this is our nation, and we must pray, all right? Then we pray for the sick and the suffering, specific needs, and then the deceased. All right, we're halfway done, everybody. Hang in there with us. Now, we turn to liturgy of the Eucharist. As you can see on the slide up there, liturgy of the Eucharist. This is the next part of the mass, all right. We begin, we're halfway home, we begin with the offertory. Here, gifts are brought to the altar. Why do we bring gifts to the altar? Because, again, it's scriptural. Matthew 5, 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. This is important. Gifts on behalf of the people. All right, gifts on behalf of the people are given to the priest. You bring them up to me, the gifts of bread and wine, and then it's going to be transformed, and then the priest is going to give those gifts back to you in a better, more incredible way. You brought the gifts forward that are just bread and wine. The priest is going to transform them through the in persona Christi of Jesus, and he's going to give them back to you in a way that brings you eternal life. This is in Holy Communion. We'll get to that. We also bring forth our tithes. The collection, right? Oh, here you go, Father. You are truly Catholic. You're talking about bringing money in. Well, you know what? People tithe to Jesus. The apostles gave of their belongings to help the ministry continue. Now, Catholics, we don't teach that you have to tithe 10% like the Protestants, but God puts on your heart how much you can. Why we do that? Because we bring it forward because God supplies everything we have, all of us what we have, and only asks for a tiny portion of it back. This is powerful. Now, preparation of the gifts, now at the altar, right, has two purposes. The bread and the wine that will be offered will be offered in sacrifice to God, and then the priest and you, the people, will prepare yourselves also to be offered to God. So it's just not preparation of the bread and the wine, it'll be a preparation of the priest and the people. This is important. All right, now, this is the time to bring everything in your heart, like the gifts, God is gonna transform these gifts and he can transform what you bring forward in your prayer intentions. Now, what do the people say? The people always say that the angels, your guardian angel brings forth your prayer intentions. The mystics tell us that when the, when the mass is going on, especially a consecration, your guardian angels come forward and they kneel around the altar and they're holding vessels. And the mystics tell us, and people ask what's in those vessels, and the mystics tell us what's in those vessels are what you put into it. Oh, Father, I don't go to Mass because I don't get anything out of it. My goodness, you can't get anything more out of it, eternal life, but it's also about what you put into it. 
Put your hopes, your dreams, your sorrows, your joys into that gift that's coming forward to be transformed in the mass. Put your gifts, your pains, your joys, your sorrows, just like the bread and the wine, and have it transformed on this altar. Have your life be transformed on this altar. Or are you just sitting back there smacking on your gum looking at your watch? That's how I used to be, so I'm not criticizing you. I did that for 20 years until I found what this mass really means. And so, well, let's go forward here now. Now, the procession of gifts, this goes back to when people in ancient times brought forward bread and wine from their homes. Now, what happens? The priest sets up the altar, right? So we have the priest. He sets up the altar. Let's look at this here because you probably don't pay any attention when this is going on. The first thing the priest does is he unfolds what's called a corporal. Now, why is this a corporal? This is placed on the altar with the cross usually facing the priest, and it's laid out for the sacrifice of the mass. What's the real purpose of this? It's practical so that any particles of the blessed sacrament that may fall are captured, and then at the end of mass are folded up to be properly taken care of. Now, next is the priest will take the bread, and as we see here, he will bless it. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands that will become for us the bread of life. This is a traditional Jewish meal prayer of biblical times. Jesus would have said that prayer actually at the Last Supper. Then, after the, blood, the, the, the bread is blessed. Now this is removed from the chalice. The chalice is the cup of, of, of the precious blood, and this is called a purificator. This is a folded cloth that will be used to wipe any precious blood or the doorposts of our souls. Remember, the doorposts in the Old Testament, the blood of the lamb was put over the doors so the angel of death passed by. Well, guess what? When the precious blood touches your lips, the doorposts to your soul, you have protection. So we use the purificator. Now we have the cruets, which these cruets consist of what right now is uh, bread, excuse me, wine and water. It looks like wine. The accidents are wine, and right now the substance is wine. But in a minute, that substance will no longer be wine. It'll still look like wine and taste like wine in its accidents, the church calls it, but in its substance, it will actually be the precious blood of Christ. So the priest pours the wine, and what does he do? He adds a drop of water to be placed in the wine. Now, why is this? This is important, okay? This is very important, okay? The priest, as he's adding the water and the wine, prays, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Notice, divinity, humanity, this is what's important. Once you put the water into the wine, it's impossible to separate it. You don't take it out again. Because of Jesus, humanity is now never separated from his divinity. This is the mixing of what Christ Jesus did in his humanity and his divinity. And when we mix it, it symbolizes the unity of the church with Jesus. Jesus is the wine, the church is the water, and it's mixed together. Now, after it is mixed, the priest blesses it. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands that will become our spiritual drink. And then he places over it, what is this called? A pall. Now we think of palls at funerals, right? What do the palls do? They lay over the casket. What are we doing here? All right, the pall, what is the purpose of the pall? Believe it or not, there's a practical purpose here. If the priest doesn't do it, he's not violating, it's not an invalid mass or an illicit mass. If the priest doesn't put it there, he's not violating anything, but why do we? Actually, believe it or not, it's a practical purpose to keep the bugs out. Yes, this is true. And I never used to really use a Paul. I didn't pay any attention to it when I was first ordained until I went to a good friend's parish and I was celebrating mass. This priest is a good friend of mine. 
and I'm the main celebrant, he's behind me, and we pour the precious blood, I bless it, or the wine, I blessed it, and later on we did the consecration prayers, and the consecration prayers give you now the precious blood, right? So there was no Paul, and what happened? Well, you can guess it, the biggest horsefly that you could ever imagine buzzing around the altar straight into the precious blood. Now, am I allowed to take that horsefly out and just flick it off to the side? No, I'm not. So this big, giant horsefly is in the precious blood. We finish the consecration prayers. It is now time to consume. What does the priest do here? You got it. The priest must consume. So guess what I did? I'm the main celebrant. I turn over to my friend, the priest, who was his parish I was at, and I said to him, I said, it's your parish. In other words, you drink. (laughs) And God bless my priest friend. He looked at me and he said, you're the main celebrant. So down it went whole thing, and that is why I today use a Paul. All right, so let's keep continuing with the Mass. Now, the priest quietly says, after he finishes blessing the wine and putting the Paul over it, he bends over and he bows down and he says, with humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice, not just mine, our, in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. You never even hear this prayer. And the priest is praying on your behalf as you're sitting there in the back of the pew, walking out the door, chomping on your gum. No, this is important. The priest then turns around and the server washes his hands, right? This is also important. Why does he wash his hands? Well, Father, it's time of coronavirus. He needs to keep them clean. Okay. Yes, the priest tradition would wash his hands to keep them clean because back in the day, part of the mass used to be vegetables and fruits and there would be maybe fertilizer, let's say, on them. But it's also important that that priest, when his hands are washed, who when he does, he says, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The washing of the hands is very important because it's a symbolic cleansing. All right, now people always complain, I'm not going to that priest, he's not holy. Um, I think that priest is a sinner. We're all sinners. But guess what happens when that priest washes his hands? His sins are suspended. Suspended so he could actually confect the Eucharist. So that he can confect the Eucharist. So no matter what that priest has done, you still receive a valid holy communion. Don't worry about the priest. Jesus will deal with him. You worry about getting the precious blood which he is giving to you as a priest no matter what he's done. We pray that every priest in the whole world is in a state of grace. But don't worry, if not, you are still receiving a valid holy communion. You just pray for those priests that you suspect that. Pray for them to get help. Pray for them to get grace. Don't don't condemn them. Pray for them, Jesus says to St. Faustina. All right, now, this is important. Okay, so then the priest comes back to the altar and what does he do? The priest turns back to the, to the prayers of the mass and we have the prayers over the gifts. Graciously sanctify these gifts, O Lord, we pray. And he goes on with the prayers over the offerings. Now, as that, before he did that, actually I missed a part. He says, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. And what do you say? May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name for our good and the good of all his holy church. This is the congregation giving your approval. This is why it's so needed. All right, now as I said, we get to the prayers over the gifts which was said differently at each mass depending upon the feast or the season. All right, now, let's get into it. And what do you say? Amen which means what? I believe. All right, now, we get to the part of the uh, mass, which is called the preface. Preface means something before something else is about to happen. 
you preface something with something else means it comes first. Now, in the preface, we have the priest goes back to the altar. He's here at the altar. And what does he say? Again, the Lord be with you a third time. And again, where does that come from? Ruth 2.4, the Lord be with you. And what do you say? And with your spirit. Again, 2 Timothy 4.22, the Lord be with your spirit. Then you say, lift up, I'm, I'm sorry, I say, lift up your hearts. Where does that come from? Lamentations 341, Old Testament. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. And then what do you say? We lift them up to the Lord. You're responding. And then I say, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Where does that come from? Colossians 1, verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you say, it is right and just. Where does that come from? Proverbs 21.3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord. It is right and just. Now, I read then the preface, something like, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to claim you, O Lord, but in this time above all, to laud you yet more gloriously. You know what this prayer is? The preface, which applies also to a specific feast or season, it's thanksgiving. In every preface, we are thinking, who are the mass prayers addressed to? Everybody says Jesus. The prayers of the mass are addressed to the Father through the sacrifice of the Son. In this mass, we are praying entirely except one little part that's to Jesus, and I'll point that out coming up. The entire mass is to the Father. We are accepting the sacrifice made to him by the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. In thanksgiving, we read the preface. It's just an announcement. The priest, in the name of God's people, thanks and praises the Father for the gift of his Son. Now at the end of this, at the end of the preface, we sing together the unending hymn of your glory as we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Where does this come from? Again, pull out your Bible, Catholics. Old Testament, Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. All right, now, this is also the cheers that came for Jesus on Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest, holy, holy, holy. All right, so now we're into the pureness of the mass, the Eucharistic prayer. And I'm gonna use Eucharistic prayer two just because it is the shortest and I have just a limited amount of time left here. All right, let's begin with Eucharistic prayer two. The priest raises his hands and he says, you are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Where does this come from? Let's go back to the Old Testament, 2 Maccabees 1436. So now, remember, I said, holy, you are holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Maccabees says, O holy one, Lord of all holiness, keep undefiled forever this house that has been so recently purified. Right now, our house, the church is being purified. That's why all these things are being exposed. The pains and the wounds have now been exposed to the air, and this air is going to heal the wound. This is what's happening. We're cleansing out the junk. Pope Benedict said the church will be smaller, but it'll be more faithful. I think after this pandemic, we're gonna see the same thing. Many people aren't gonna come back to church, but the ones who do will be the most faithful. That's what we are going to be experiencing. Now, the priest then removes the purificator, I mean the, um, the um, Paul, and he lay, puts his hands over together like this. What is this? This is called the epiclesis. Epiclesis means the word in Greek to call down. We are calling down the Holy Spirit to bless and transform this bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. So the epiclesis is very, very important, okay? Basically, it's an invocation of the Holy Spirit. The priest is asking the Father to send the Holy Spirit to change 
this bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Epicles, as I said, means call down. Then what does the priest pray? Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall that they may become for us. And the priest's hands are over and he makes a sign of the cross, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that was done with the epiclesis. Where does that come from? John 6, 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Listen to the prayer again. Call down the Holy Spirit like the dewfall so that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the priest is asking the Holy Spirit to transform these gifts like Christ did at the Last Supper. He is the person of Christ. He is in persona Christi. This is why the priest, please don't beat up the church, has to be a man. It's not about sexism. Actually, a cloistered nun is a higher vocational calling than a diocesan priest. Not factoring in the sacraments, just the way of life. Because Martha chose, or um, uh, Mary chose the better half. I'm more Martha, so I defend Martha, more of the worker bee. But later, the priest will ask the Holy Spirit to come and transform you as well, not just the body and blood. That'll be a second epiclesis, which I bet hardly any of you have ever known is going on in the Mass. All right, now, the priest continues. This is what he's reading in the book. At the time he was betrayed, where does that come from? Luke 22, verse three. Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And entered willingly into his passion. Where does that come from? John 10, 17. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life willingly, entered willingly into his passion, right out of the Bible. All right, now, he says, he took bread, giving thanks, and broke it. Now listen to this. I'm gonna give you, now I'm not consecrating this host. Please, this is not a real mass. The priest has to have the full intent to consecrate the host. I have no intent to consecrate this bread or this wine into the body and blood of Christ. So this is not a mass. So you do not have to be concerned about my lack of reverence, not doing a sacrifice of a mass. I'm teaching what the mass is, but there's no consecration. I'm gonna read the words, but I don't have the intent. So this is not being consecrated. I have no intention to consecrate this blood or this wine or this bread. But what the words are that the priest reads during this consecration, not to consecrate it, but the words of consecration, as he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. And then the priest elevates the host and the Holy Spirit through that power. This bread and this wine, they don't, Christ doesn't come into the host like my dad, God bless him, used to tell me as a kid, God bless him for telling me that, but it, it, Christ doesn't come into the bread. The bread becomes the body and blood of Christ. It is the sacraments. This is what it is. There's an actual change of substance. Trans means change, transubstantiation. There's a change of substance. This bread now becomes the body blood of Christ. There's no bread and substance anymore. Now, in accidents, it looks like bread and tastes like bread, but the substance is now the body and blood of Christ. This is why we just can't throw it in the garbage. This is eternal life here. Now, in a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me, and the priest elevates the chalice. Now, I do not have any wine or precious blood here, so please don't get upset. I'm not irreverently doing this. I'm just walking through teaching. But the priest elevates, and again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the precious blood becomes the blood of Christ, or the wine becomes the precious blood of Christ. Now, here's what we have to remember. That prayer that I just read to you Sounds a little biblical to me. Let's go to Mark 14, 22. 
And as they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and then when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. People hear that, and they say, boy, you Catholics really are gall, aren't you? You think the many means only Catholics. Nobody else can get into heaven. That is not our teaching. Yes, there's only salvation through the Catholic Church, but non-Catholics can be united, albeit imperfectly, through the Catholic Church. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be a registered member of the four walls of the church. Again, a pygmy in the rainforest can be saved, but if you were brought up in this Catholic faith, this is your ticket. This is your way to eternal life. Please don't ever lose that grace. But why does he say many? Who does many refer to? Are all people redeemed by Christ? Yes, every human being who ever lived has been redeemed by Jesus Christ. That means everyone. That's why I believe when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, he didn't feel the pain just like you or I would for ourselves. I believe, let's say the world ends today. Science tells us they believe 115 billion people have lived since the beginning of time. Today in the world, there's seven and a half billion people alive. But when you add all the people who have deceased, science tells us about 110, 115 billion people have lived since the beginning of time. If the world ended today, Jesus died for every one of them. And I believe that when that nail was driven into his hands and feet, that Jesus felt that pain, not just for himself, but he felt it 115 billion times more than you or I would feel it. Can you even imagine the pain of anything being 115 billion times more? I believe that is true because I believe he felt that pain for each and every human who ever lived. And so, for many, what does that mean? Well, Father, what does many mean? Does it mean only those souls who are in heaven? No. The people that are in hell, we know there are souls in hell. Did Christ die for them? Yep. So then who is the many? Didn't he pour out his blood for everyone? Yes, he did. He poured his blood out for everyone. When the gospels say many, they simply mean the only person not including in that is Jesus himself. He didn't pour out his blood for himself. Then many means everyone else. So Jesus redeemed the whole world, everyone, but not everybody will be saved. The choice is yours. You've been redeemed, but the choice is yours if you're saved. All right. Let's go back to Corinthians eleven twenty-four. 24. This is another passage that tells us about the consecration. And when he had given thanks, he broke, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That's 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-four. 24. Now remember and I'm going to steal here from the church fathers, the word remembrance, or anamnesis, the Greek, as Christ uses it, does not mean to remember the past. We're not recreating, right? We're, 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 Christ, we're not re-crucifying Christ, right? We are, we are representing it in a way that is all eternal. All right, our remembrance of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection is just as Jewish people use it when celebrating the Passover. It is not simply remembering and celebrating an event of the past, but it actually entails making the event real and present now so that we can enter into the share and the Paschal mystery for our salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, what this means is when you are at Mass, you are in the upper room as Christ is, is preparing this meal and this sacrifice. You are there in the upper room as it is being done. And so when we come to Mass, then in a minute we will be at Calvary as Christ is there on the cross paying our debt to sin. We're not re-crucifying Christ. You are actually there at Calvary as Jesus is paying your debt to sin on that cross. That's why when people say, oh, geez, you know, you Catholics, you have Christ on that cross. My Jesus is risen. Yeah, so is mine. But that cross is what's going on at this mass as you come to receive the gift he gives you of redemption because he paid the penalty for sin, the sin you have committed, the sin I committed, the sin that means we deserve to die. And yet Christ paid that price. You are there at Calvary. 
Pope Benedict tells us in spirit of the liturgy, when you come to mass, the church, it's like the roof of the church opens up and heaven and earth ascend and descend and the angels and the saints are united. Heaven and earth is united like never before. And in this mass, the roof opens up and this beautiful uniting of, of, of heaven and earth. This is what the book of Revelation is about. It's not about the rapture or the antichrist. This book of Revelation is about the wedding feast of the lamb. And so, the consecration, through Christ's own words that I just read you in the Bible, we have transubstantiation. Now, when the priest elevates the host, we just heard bells ringing. Now, well, maybe you picked that up on the microphone. But when the priest elevates some masses, we have bells, some we do not. Is it a requirement? No. The tradition was going back to the Latin mass when the priest was at the high altar. They didn't know sometimes the people at what point the mass they were at, and they would ring the bells to let them know that we were at the consecration of the mass. All right, now, let's get then, after the consecration, the priest says what? The memorial acclamation. The mystery of faith. And this is called a mystery of faith because God had to reveal it to us. We have to have faith to believe it. And what do you respond? There's a couple different responses. I'll just pick one. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Take a guess. You got it. Biblical, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six. 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. I mean, whoa, this entire mass is scriptural. And we, don't, and we, we sit there and nod in, in agreement when non-Catholics tell us we're not biblical. We are the church from which the Bible came. People say, well, Father, I don't belong to Catholic Church because I'm about the Bible. Well, what you need to say to them is, God bless you. But do you accept that Bible? Yes, I do, Father. Do you accept everything that's in it? Yes, I do, Father. Do you accept the words and the authority from which it came? Yes, I do, Father. Congratulations. You accept the authority of the Catholic Church. Because you know where that Bible came from? That Bible came from the bishops of the Catholic Church at the councils of Carthage and Hippo in 393 and 397 AD. The Mass predates the Bible. The Mass was instituted by Christ in the upper room on Holy Thursday and has been said since the apostles after Pentecost for every day since then. The Mass, the scripture didn't come for decades later. The scriptures were brought to us to be read at the Mass. They are both critically important, three legs of our stool. We have scripture, tradition, and magisterium. And in that is the Mass. All right, so this is important. Now, when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we said, now, this is again an attachment of a meal to the cross. We eat and then we proclaim Christ's death. That's what the Paschal meal is all about. That's what the Passover meal was. They had to eat the lamb. And do you know that the sacrificed lamb in the book of John was sacrificed at noon on Good Friday, which is the time Jesus was nailed to the cross? He is the sacrificed lamb. But in the Old Testament, you had to eat the lamb or the sacrifice was invalid. This is what we're doing at the mass. We're eating the lamb, the sacrificed lamb. All right, it's not a reenactment because we've entered into sacred time. Because God is divine, it is always going on. We are in mystery here. All right, hang with me. We're wrapping up. All right, the priest then turns to the final part of the Eucharistic prayer. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation. Notice, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation. Where does this come from? You guessed it, John 6, 51. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. He will eat this bread, will live forever. That is salvation. And then the priest says, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. This comes from Matthew 4, 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. All right, any of you who are really paying attention could say, all right, Father, this is a problem because in the Mass it says we minister to Jesus, in the Scripture it says the angels did. Matthew 4, 11. You got it. Who's higher? Who was created higher? 
the man or the angel? The angel was created higher than man. Angel, by nature, is higher than man. He has a superior intellect. He's not constrained by space and time. He doesn't get sick. He doesn't get the coronavirus. The angel, by nature, is created above man. But by grace, after the fall, when God redeemed man and God became one of us, man was elevated above the angel by grace. So in nature, the angel's higher than man. By grace, man has been elevated above the angel. And so now we minister to God, to Christ, and this is what it says in the Bible. All right, let's keep going. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. All right, where does this come from? 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not participation of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is not participation in the body of Christ. We are one. We are many in one body. This is exactly what I just read in the missal. All right? Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Mitchell, our Bishop, and all the clergy. That comes right out of 1 Corinthians 13. We pray for the church. We pray for charity to love our brothers. All right, let's keep going. Last couple pages. All right, remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Fallen asleep, resurrection. Where do we get this? 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead by the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For us by a man came death, but by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. All Eucharistic prayers pray for the resurrection of the dead. All right, welcome them into the light of your face. I read this in the Mass. Where does that come from? Psalm 31, 15. Let thy face shine on thy servant, O Lord. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed apostles and the saints and all who pleased you throughout the ages, non-Catholics come to Mass and they hear that one line, they don't like it. The Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God. How do you call her blessed? Why do you call her Mother of God? Well, Luke does. Luke 1, 42. Blessed are you among women, Elizabeth said. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me that the Mother of my Lord, Mother of God, should come to me? We are simply repeating the words of Scripture. This is amazing. All right, and then we finish. We may be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your son, Jesus Christ. This is Romans 8, 16. We are children of God and of children, heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, glorified with him. That is why we say co-heirs to eternal life and we praise and glorify him. Again, right out of scripture. All right, now here we are. The supercharged moment of the Mass, as Father Mike Gately says, and I've been teaching all along. The supercharged moment of the Mass. You know, our whole faith can be summarized in the concept of a circle. All comes from God, all will return to God. All came from God, the first great act of mercy, creation. As I said to you earlier, we got broken. So that first great act of mercy was creation. All of creation is present before God at the Mass, even if you're physically not here. Then, in the second great act of mercy, because we got broken in the garden, second great act of mercy, second person of the Trinity came down, redeemed us. Now, guess who? In the third, and the final, and the greatest act of mercy, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, will sanctify us, that's the third great act of mercy, and bring us back to God the Father from where we came, all fixed, repaired, and better than ever before. When I was growing up as a kid, my favorite show in the world was The Six Million Dollar Man. And in it, it says this man, Steve Austin, astronaut, a man barely alive. He was broken. But he said, gentlemen, we have the technology to make him better, faster, stronger, better than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, God has more than technology. God has the grace when we fall and we're broken, worse than Steve Austin, the astronaut, because we were in our soul broken, he had the power to rebuild us. 
the power to make us better than we were before. And we unite now in the divine life of the Trinity, which we never had before. And now we are being brought back through the power of the Holy Spirit, back to God the Father. I ask people all the time, when does this happen? People tell me, oh, Father, at our baptism, yes, we are divinized. Father, at our death, when we behold the beatific vision, yes, when we enter into heaven, we, we are divinized. But where does it happen every minute, every day, somewhere around the world? Right here, through him, and with him, and in him. Oh God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. What is going on? You are being returned back to God the Father through the sacrifice of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. My gosh, I don't get anything out of the Mass. There's nothing more you can get out of the Mass. That is why the Mass is perfect prayer. Yes, we need to pray in our own bedrooms, but our prayer is not perfect. We are blocked by sin. In our mass, we are perfected because the mass is God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son back to God the Father in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Sound familiar? You got it. That's the chaplet of divine mercy. And that's why that chaplet prayer is so powerful. I wish I could go into it now, but I know you guys are getting tired and I'm trying to wrap her up here. But we're finishing up. This is why Jesus died on the cross. The penalty for sin is death. He paid it with his death. His death paid our debt. Now we are sanctified and we're being brought back to God the Father for all eternity. This is why the priest says that prayer. And guess what? Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, Brother Mark is going to put on there the final two slides, communion rite. So you'll see on the screen the communion rite is now where we're getting ready to. This is where the priest then, after he places the patent down and the chalice, and he leads us in what prayer? The Our Father. This is again scriptural. I wish I had time to go to the Our Father, but I don't. Matthew 6, 9. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This whole prayer verbatim is in the scriptures. And the priest is doing what? The priest is like this in what's called the Oran's position. Are you supposed to be doing this? No. Again, you're not gonna not get into heaven because you went like this at the Our Father. But it's a priestly position. So we should, in the laity, have their hands folded at the Our Father. We say it because we do not pray alone. The whole church and the saints is praying with us. Then, after the priest finishes... The Our Father, he says what? Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are in anticipation. This comes from Titus 2.13. Awaiting the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. You can't get anything more out of this mass. It's scriptural. It's salvific. It's grace. It's everything. Then, this is what God tells us. The Father's plan is that the Son will save us. But we need to pray this daily. This is the Our Father. All right, now, the priest says, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will forever and ever. Where does that come from? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. That's what I just read to you, John 14, 27. Then the priest says, the peace of the Lord be with you. That also, John 20, 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then you say, and with your spirit. And then I say, let us offer each other the sign of peace. But remember, that is at the discretion of the priest, especially now in the time of the virus. The first word Jesus spoke to the apostles after he rose from the dead was peace. So this is what is very important. All right, now, he takes away fear and anxiety. Our Lord is saying peace to you. So take away your fear and anxiety, approach Holy Communion, shed your fears, turn to God and receive him. Now we are at the fraction right. 
The fraction, right, fraction means to break. The priest breaks the host, right? He breaks the host, literally, and then he puts a small piece into the chalice. Why? And the priest prays a prayer. May the mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. This is powerful. A body without blood is dead, so when Christ's body, again, this is not consecrated. This is not consecrated. When his body is reunited with his blood, he is risen. He is risen. Then, what do you say? The people, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. We say it three times. Again, this comes from John 1, 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. This is exactly from John the Baptist in the Bible. All right, then the priest says a quiet prayer. All right, and he says, May the receiving of your body and blood, you never hear this. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your love and mercy, be for me protection of mind and body and a healing remedy. Then the priest genuflects, and he stands up, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And this is going to be, in a minute, I'm going to tell you why that's so critically important. But again, it comes right from Revelation 19.9. Blessed are they who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Book of Revelation is not, as I said, about the Antichrist or the rapture. It's about the mass. Now, people say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and I shall be, my soul shall be healed. This comes right from Matthew 8, 8, the prayer of the centurion. Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. Then, the priest says quietly, may the body and blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. All right, you guys have been doing great. You're hanging in there. Now we are to the Holy Communion. How do you receive Holy Communion? Well, there are many ways. Follow the ways the church teaches. All right. The way that you are to receive is to come forward with your hands folded. All right. Not like this, preferably with nothing in your arms. Sometimes that's impossible if you have a child or something. But we try our best to have our hands folded. We understand God's first and foremost is the family. So, yes. Don't be bringing up, you don't need to be bringing up bags and, 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 and even purses and stuff, maybe if you have valuables or something. Just, we want to use our, our, our best discretion, okay? And we come forward, hands are to be folded, and you bow the head slightly at the waist, and you come forward. Now, you either, when the priest says the body of Christ, have your mouth open to receive him, or the church does allow in the United States by an indult of the USCCB, the College of, or a Conference of Bishops, to receive in the hand. And in the hand, we can receive and then place it on our tongue. No gloves. Somebody got very upset with me because I would not put the Blessed Sacrament or the host into their knit gloves. We cannot do that. But please, don't come forward to me and go like this. Because... I don't know which way you want to receive. So you are, you have the discretion to receive either way. Uh, Bishop Anthanasius Snyder has said that you have the right, nobody by canon law can say you cannot receive by the tongue. You are allowed to receive by the tongue. You are also allowed to kneel. No priest can deny you Holy Communion because you have chosen to kneel to receive. Now, the norm is to receive on the tongue. But as I said, an indult was given to receive in the hand. So I'm not criticizing the hand at all. But I do smile because I just read uh, Get Us Out of Here by Maria Sima. She is a known mystic in, um, in the church. Uh, this is not church position, and this is not my position, but I thought I would share it with you. Maria Sima said that the bishops who approved the receiving of Holy Communion in the hand will have to remain in purgatory until the rule is changed. 
So that does not mean you are not allowed to receive in the hand, you are. The key is reverently. Whether you receive in the tongue or on the hand, it is to be reverently, okay? In the hand or on the tongue, it is to be reverently, all right? The bishops have given you the permission, so you are not sinning by receiving in the hand, but you need to make that decision, all right? Bishop Schneider also said um, that, you know, we have to use our heads and, on how we are receiving either ha- uh, by the tongue or by the hands to minimize contact and to minimize the spread of germs, okay? Now, personally, you have to go with what your heart says. Now, Germ 160 said the norm is to receive standing. But again, you can receive if you want to kneel. The priest cannot deny that. But here's the point. The point is reverence. When you come to this mass, this is your wedding. We are at the wedding feast. Well, Father, I got married on July 28th, uh, 1976. Great. God bless you. But we are preparing in this mass for the true wedding, the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is the true wedding. And when you come up this aisle, you are like the bride. You are making your wedding march. And when you go to a Catholic wedding, what happens? You see the bride. She is making her wedding march up this aisle. Who's waiting for her at the altar? The groom, her groom. And in the Catholic wedding, what happens? The two join together. And that night, it's consummated. The bride and the groom become one. The groom enters into the bride. What happens here at the mass? The groom. Who's the groom? Jesus. This is what the church has always taught. Who's the bride? the church. Who's the church? Us. And just like the wedding, the groom enters into you, the bride. You literally receive him. He enters in. The host enters into you, the bride. It is to become one. This is the wedding feast of the lamb. This is the whole meaning of the mass. And so this is the priest. He is standing in the person of Christ. This is again why he has to be a man. It is not that the church is sexist. It's just the way Jesus set it up. And again, the church is not sexist. The, the cloistered nun is such a higher calling of, than even the diocesan priest. Regarding, disregarding the sacraments, just in the way of life. But that priest who is in persona Christi stands in the person of Christ. The mass is nuptial. Christ to his church is wedded and union of the priest to the congregation. The priest is in the person of Christ. The church is the congregation, and they are wedded. Christ enters into you, the bride. This is the wedding feast of the Lamb. The church is feminine. The priest is masculine. This is the nuptial meaning of it. This is the beautiful gift that God gave us, and that one flesh then bears fruit. This is the beauty of the Mass. And then after Holy Communion, the priest comes forward and he purifies the vessels. You don't hear this, but he says, what is past our lips as food, O Lord, we may possess in purity of heart that has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. And this is what he purifies the vessels. And then after Communion, um, he reads the prayer. Uh, he sits briefly in silence. Then he reads the prayer after the communion. The priest comes back to the altar, raises his hands and says, let us pray. And in that, the prayer relates again to a specific season or feast. And guess what, everybody? Last page, as we have Brother Mark put on the concluding right slide. There you have it. We are concluding the most hour of power of our entire life this one hour of the mass, and in my case here, sorry, a little longer than an hour. But here we give the priest after reading the final prayer, um, does the announcements for the parish community, and then he finishes with a greeting and a blessing. And what does he say? You guessed it, the Lord be with you. And you say, and with your spirit. And the priest says, may almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This comes right out of Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, in scripture, a blessing always meant a communication of divine breath. Remember, the word comes to you from the breath That Holy Spirit is being given to you and is meant to give spiritual strength and it transforms the one who is blessed. In the Bible, when somebody is blessed, they're given the breath of a spirit and that breath of the spirit transforms them. This is what just happened to you in the mass if you allow it. 
If you are properly disposed and you are engaged, this is what can happen. You say amen, which means I believe, and then there's the dismissal because the priest says, go in peace, and that comes from Luke 750. Your peace has saved you. Go, I'm sorry, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You say, thanks be to God. That comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You couldn't get a more perfect scripture passage. In the Latin, it is ite misse est, which means go. She, the church, is being sent. That's what mass actually means. It comes from the word dismissal. This is what it means. It means be sent from where we get the word mission. Remember the parable of talents? Jesus said, go and share your gifts and graces. You've received an abundance of graces in the mass. Now go and share it. The goal is to evangelize, make disciples, and then turn them into apostles. The purpose of the mass is for you to be transformed in Christ and to be sent out as an apostle. And that is actually what the word goodbye means. God be with you. And you are sent out. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. Hallelujah. All right. You guys hung in there with me. God bless you. I am sorry it took a lot longer than I thought, 24 minutes longer than I thought it was going to take. But there's just so much in the sacrifice of the Mass. And we are so glad that you could join us. Now remember, we're going to keep this recording up on our Facebook page, Divine Mercy Official, and on our uh, website, thedivinemercy.org. Please share it with your friends and family, even non-Catholics, because we want them to understand what the Catholic Church is. The, 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 dis, the, the disharmony is not because of who we are. It's what we are perceived to be. Uh, Fulton Sheen said it beautifully. He said, millions of people hate what they think is the Catholic Church. But very few people hate what actually is the Catholic Church. And so, we join with you. Please continue on this mission with us. We want to thank you. You've been supporting us, watching our live streams, all of the beautiful people that have joined us. Please, again, share this message with them. Um, just a few announcements. We will be continuing to do our live streams every day at 9 a.m. of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, every day at 3 p.m. with the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and at 5 p.m. with the Rosary. Tomorrow, we invite you to join us at the 9 a.m. Mass as um, we will do a May crowning with Our Lady. Father Anthony will be the main celebrant as we celebrate the crowning of Mothers for Mother's Day with the uh, crowning of Mary. And I would also like to invite you um, to visit our website. If you would like a DVD um, of this talk, because we can't keep this talk up on our websites forever, it will come down. But you can order on shopmercy.org. You can get my DVD that says, Explaining the Faith. I have 13 new talks. It is not just a talk about divine mercy, although there are several on divine mercy. There's talks on Mary. There's talks on suicide and suffering. Why would a good and loving God allow such suffering? There's talks on this. I have this talk on that DVD, a walkthrough of the mass. I have a talk on confession. I have a talk on communion. I have a talk on Mary. I have talks on many things. Please get that DVD of, uh, it's called, again, Explaining the Faith which I, Father Chris, and with the help of my brothers here, put together over the last several years. And then, if you do not have a DVD player anymore, uh, my thanks goes out to Brother Mark Fanders, who did, I please, make his efforts worth it. Um, you know, let his efforts not be in vain. He was up till past midnight last night preparing a way for you to download this talk uh, a, a similar talk like this, a walk through the mass, and all those other 13 talks I just talked about on a website that is on Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O. So please go to vimeo.com slash on demand, one word, slash explaining the faith. I know that's a long thing, and hopefully Brother Mark can get it up on the screen. If not, I can repeat it again. Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com slash on demand, 
slash explaining the faith. And in it, you will be able to give uh, one talk. It it's, it's helps our ministry. It's, you can get one talk. You can get all the talks, whatever you like. And on there, I do have a walkthrough of the mass. Again, all those other topics. And then finally, if you would like us to pray for you, and we would love to add you to our prayer list. There's no cost. There's no obligation. Please visit our websites. Um, you can go to thedivinemercy.org or micprayers.org dot org or dot com again m-i-c for marians of the immaculate conception prayers so m-i-c prayers dot org and on that you can go simply it takes 10 seconds you can come on with us at no cost and you can be part of our association of marian helpers on that you have something very special by the decree of the holy see you can be, participate in all of our graces. You can receive the graces of all our masses, rosaries, penances, prayers, sacrifices, just as if you were a Marian priest of the Immaculate Conception. You can't get a better deal than that. You, by decree of the Holy See, we are a spiritual benefit society, and if you go to micprayers.org or .com, it's for Marians of the Immaculate Conception, Simply put your email. We'll, you don't have to. If you don't want to receive mail or anything, that's okay. You just you want to be on our prayer list. We will also send you information on divine mercy to help keep you educated and to get you to heaven, you and your family. So with that, I finished at one hour and 29 minutes. God bless all of you for staying with us, and we hope that you'll remain with us in our Marian family through these live broadcasts. Stay tuned for more to come. But right now, go to the Get Those Talks, visit shopmercy.org, get the DVD, or visit vimeo.com slash on demand slash explaining the faith, get it downloadable, or most of all, get our prayers. That's most important. Let us pray for you, you pray for us, and that is micprayers.org or .com. So God bless all of you, and may I leave you with a blessing. Heavenly Father, may Almighty God, may you descend upon the Holy Spirit upon all of those viewing this, this talk, all of those coming forth to you to receive your mercy. Through the intercession of Mary and all the saints, and through the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, may Almighty God bless you and your loved ones in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, and God bless you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. If you're like us in the state of Massachusetts, where our governor has extended the non-essential business closure, you're going to be at home looking for things to do. There is probably no better time ever before or after than right now than to get closer to God. You see, you cannot love what you do not know. So we want to help you to love God a little bit more by knowing Him. Instead of sitting at home on your couch watching reruns of Miami Vice like my cameraman Giuseppe. No, I don't. I, I think that we have an opportunity now more than ever to learn our faith. That is why I have produced a new video, DVD series, that can be used as small groups and parishes or right at home on your own couch. It is called Explaining the Faith. These are my 13 favorite talks I've ever done that are regarding what we need to know about Jesus, Mary, confession, communion, why would a good and loving God allow suffering, and especially a walkthrough of the entire Mass from the start to the finish and everything that you need to know about it. Tell you what, here's a quick clip. In the church, it's just not come to stand, sit, and kneel. It's to engage in this most incredible mystery. This is what it is. The church, what makes the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ is the sacraments. The sacraments are just symbols. They do something. They're actual grace. Sacraments, if you remember your definition from catechism, are efficacious signs, meaning efficacious, they do something. They're not just symbols. They're efficacious signs of God's grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is given to us. We have it so that Christ can enter into us and live in us. Now, if we don't receive him worthily, what happens? We lose that grace. 
So please consider, now is the time to get closer to God and we're going to show you how. As I said, this DVD series has 13 talks that you'll be able to learn more and share your faith with everyone that you love to help get yourself and them to heaven. So please visit shopmercy.org or call 1-800-462-7426 to understand our faith better than ever before and to hear it explained in a way like never before. Thank you and God bless you.